Welcome everyone to AP Environmental Science Lecture on the Carbon Cycle. So we're going to be looking at two learning objectives today. The primary one that we're going to be talking about is uh, topic 1.4, which is the carbon cycle. Um, and we are still with our biogeochemical cycles and the enduring understanding is that ecosystems are the result of biotic and abiotic interactions and carbon cycles between both biotic and abiotic components of the earth. The learning objective just to be able to explain the steps and reservoir interactions of the carbon cycle and as usual we'll go to the essential knowledge at the end. But the second learning objective here is topic 9.4. So we're jumping ahead a little bit into increases in the greenhouse gases. All right, the enduring understanding for this is local and regional human activities can have impacts at the global level. And the learning objective, be able to identify the threats to human, um, human health and the environment posed by increasing greenhouse gases. So these two learning objectives are really linked together. So that's why we're going to talk about both of them. So similar to what we did with the water cycle, the hydrologic cycle, I'm going to give you guys all the vocab first, and then we're going to look at the cycle, and I'll explain the cycle. A few things that I want to point out, I'm not going to read this entire thing to you. A lot of this should be review, but a few things I'm going to point out. Sources and sinks. A source is any process that releases carbon into the atmosphere. That carbon could be in the form of CO2, could be in the form of methane, or carbon monoxide. Okay? Um, a common source would be cellular respiration. So aerobic cellular respiration, what you are doing right now as you are breathing, you are releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere with every breath. A sink is any process that removes carbon from the atmosphere. Okay, so a good one is photosynthesis. Photosynthesis draws carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and locks it into plant tissues. Okay, chemically alters it, takes that carbon and puts it into these sugars, which can then be turned into all kinds of other um, um, other molecules in the plants, whether that is uh, complex carbohydrates or secondary metabolites or whatever. Um, when we're talking about sinks, there's two further terms. Uh, carbon sequestration, this is the actual step that removes carbon from the atmosphere and then stores it. So plants doing photosynthesis is um, carbon sequestration. A carbon reservoir is once that carbon is stored. So say that you have um, all this plant tissue, like leaf litter and branches that fall to the ground, and it locks that carbon in the soil. Okay, so carbon reservoir is carbon that is stored, locked in a certain place for a very long time, um, geologically significant period of time. Okay, but you guys should pause this now and um, jot down all of this vocab. So a little bit more about sources and sinks before we get to the cycle itself. So again, a source is any process that releases um, a carbon containing gas into the atmosphere. That could be carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, or methane. And the common sources. Um, in this class, we're going to talk a lot about fossil fuel combustion. That is going to release carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. Cement production is going to release carbon dioxide. We'll talk about the cellular or the um, the chemical for uh, the chemical reactions that happen there later on cellular respiration is going to release carbon dioxide if it's aerobic if it is anaerobic it's going to release methane and methane is an even more po potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide volcanic eruptions are going to release carbon dioxide and a little bit of carbon monoxide but not a lot any type of combustion. So this could be a candle burning in your room. This could be a fireplace um, in your living room. This could be a forest fire. Any type of combustion is going to release carbon dioxide and maybe a little bit of carbon monoxide from incomplete combustion if there's not enough oxygen in the air. Deforestation is going to release carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and methane. It's going to release carbon dioxide through both cellular respiration as uh, fungi and bacteria start to break down the dead wood that remains from the deforestation, but also because there's often a combustion part to deforestation, right? So you go through and you deforest an area and you get all of the um, all of the logs of any trees that have monetary value. You sell those. Um, but anything that remains, anything like all the brush, anything, all the all the um, the limbs off of those trees, they get piled up and burned in many cases. 
It could also release methane if we're talking about anaerobic decomposition that happens um, from all the material that's left over from deforestation. Waste incinerators, this is a type of combustion, so it's going to release carbon dioxide and potentially a little bit of methane, but probably not a lot because you'll have complete combustion going on. Landfills are going to release all three, primarily carbon dioxide and methane. And then industrial manufacturing, um, so many different processes involved in that, but pro primarily carbon dioxide. Okay. Um, carbon dioxide is really the one that we're worried about the most. Methane is a more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is, so we're definitely worried about that. Carbon monoxide um, is definitely worrisome, and it typically comes from incomplete combustion, but there's often much, much less of that being released than carbon dioxide. Okay. For the sinks, a sink, again, is any anything where that stores carbon for a very long period of time, so any process that draws carbon down and stores it. Um, and we'll talk about these at length through the semester, as we will the sources. But soil is a great carbon sink. There is tons and tons and tons of carbon locked in soil, primarily from vegetation, putting organic matter into that soil, but also from inorganic carbon in that soil as well. The oceans, um, there is carbon, di carbon dioxide just readily dissolves into the oceans, and it can... Um, in the ocean react with water to form carbonate ions, which can then be, um, you know, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself in here, but they can be um, uh, react with, with calcium and form inorganic sediments, or they can um, react with calcium in a living thing and form organic tissue um, or organic limestone and then settle to the bottom of the ocean. So that's what we're talking about here. Those two are pretty much linked. Uh, reforestation, so basically using vegetation and growing forests, um, and afforestation. So reforestation is adding forests um, to an area where they were once forests, but they've been cut down, and we are reforesting that area. Aforestation is planting trees in an area where there was previously not forest. It was some other biome, could be a grassland, could have been a desert, and then you add trees to that area and establish them and establish a forest. Uh, carbon capture and storage technology, so some um, innovative technology that could potentially draw carbon dioxide straight out of the atmosphere and then capture it for a long period of time. And then swamps, peat bogs, and permafrost. This is kind of getting both to both vegetation and soil, but they hold a significant portion of carbon dioxide or a significant amount of carbon. I shouldn't say carbon dioxide, but a significant amount of carbon. Um, so I thought they deserve their own bullet point. All right, so the cycle itself. This cycle looks deceptively um, simple. It doesn't have as many arrows as the hydrologic cycle did. However, it is probably more important for this class than um, the hydrologic cycle. It's probably the most important cycle. Okay. The main driver of this cycle, just like the hydrologic cycle, is the sun. The sun powers photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Animals, bacteria, um, fungi are primarily mostly dependent on photosynthesis. Okay, so the sun is the major driver. There is also the geologic portion of this. So the geologic portion, which we'll get to later, but the sun is the primary driver because it powers photosynthesis and photosynthesis and so the respiration are the biotic drivers of this cycle. Okay, so let's start in the atmosphere. We're gonna stick with carbon dioxide just to make things simple. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It can get drawn down by photosynthesis. Okay, so carbon dioxide from the atmosphere gets taken up by plants, and those plants use that carbon um, from the carbon dioxide to make their tissues. Okay, so they literally take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and incorporate it into their tissues. They do not take any carbon from the soil. Okay, plants take all of the carbon from the um, in their biomass from the atmosphere, which is pretty crazy if you think about a, you know, 2,000 pound oak tree, that 2,000 pound oak tree is primarily cellulose, and a lot of that uh, dry weight of that tree is carbon. All of that carbon came from the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide. 
animals will eat those plants, plants will respire, fungi will um, decompose those plants, bacteria will decompose those plants, and they will all respire and take um, or release either carbon dioxide or methane into the atmosphere. Okay, and these two pretty much balance each other out. It's not complete balancing, but it's pretty much balancing each other out. Okay, there is a little bit of this um, uh, of this biomass of this plant matter that gets locked in the soil. Okay, but more or less, this is a um, complete balanced reaction. Photosynthesis drawing it down, cellular respiration putting it back into the atmosphere. Okay. Over on the right, we have the air-sea gas exchange. Carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is going to dissolve into the oceans. And when it dissolves into the oceans, it can react, or it often does, react with water to form carbonic acid, which is H2CO3. And that reaction is balanced for us. Okay, but some of that dissociates and some of the CO2 that is in the water leaves the ocean and goes back into the atmosphere. So we have this air-sea gas exchange where carbon dioxide goes in, carbon dioxide goes out of the oceans. Okay, in the oceans, some of the dissolved carbon dioxide is just going to be carbon dioxide and it's going to drive marine photosynthesis. And then there's going to be respiration in the oceans, and those two are going to be mostly equal and opposite, drawing carbon dioxide down through photosynthesis and releasing it back again into the atmosphere through respiration. Okay, But not all of it is going to um, get released back into the atmosphere through respiration. Much of it, especially limestone, which is CaCO3, will form ocean sediments. Okay, so some of this um, organic matter is going to settle down to the ocean bottom and form sediments. Okay, organic sediments primarily. And then we have the geologic portion of this. The geologic portion, um, carbon dioxide will be released through volcanism. Carbon dioxide will also be drawn down through weathering. So weathering of terrestrial rocks, we'll show this a little bit later, will draw carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and incorporate it into inorganic limestone. So again, CaCO3. And that will form not only soil carbon, but also um, soil sediments, okay? Um, when going back to this photosynthesis, some of this, again, I said some of this um, carbon from both types of photosynthesis are going to get locked in either sediments or soil. When they do, if the conditions are right, they can form fossil carbon. Fossil carbon is otherwise known as coal, oil, and natural gas. All right, that carbon can stay locked as organic geologic carbon for very, very long periods of times, hundreds of millions of years, okay? So let me erase all of my chicken scratch, all of my really poor handwriting, and just go through the cycle one more time, okay? The main driver, again, is the sun, and the sun is going to power um, uh, photosynthesis. Okay, that is going to draw carbon dioxide down into, um, into biomass, either in the terrestrial system or the oceanic system. Equal and opposite of that is respiration, and respiration will take that organic matter and burn it and put that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. Plants respire, algae respire, animals respire, fungi, bacteria, protists, they all respire, okay? That carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere can also dissolve into the oceans. When it dissolves into the oceans, it can form um, carbonate ions. Those carbonate ions can react with calcium in living things or in 
um, just the ocean water itself and precipitate out into limestone. When it's in living things, those living things can settle to the bottom and uh, form sediments and form limestone sediments themselves. All right. On land, um, some of that carbon from um, living things can get locked in the soil. And in both the land and in the water, that carbon can get locked as fossil carbon if conditions are right for um, fossil, um, fossil fuel formation. All right. Now there's one other thing that we haven't really talked about up here, which is the human emissions part. We are taking this fossil carbon that has been locked in the soil for, or locked in the rock for millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years, and we are combusting it. And again, any type of combustion releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and we are releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere through fossil fuel combustion. Okay, so there is a net increase of CO2 in the atmosphere from this entire process. If we were just looking at the natural aerial arrows on this, you know, um, marine photosynthesis and respiration, um, terrestrial photosynthesis and respiration, the weathering of rocks and volcanism, we would see that there is basically a net um, net zero increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But this human emissions part is the one that is adding more carbon dioxide to, to the atmosphere, disrupting this whole this whole cycle and causing a net increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. All right, and that net increase is illustrated by this diagram. This diagram was um, created by the US Department of Energy, the DOE, so US Department of Energy, okay? Um, and it basically shows more or less what I showed on the last diagram where you have photosynthesis drawing carbon down, but in this case, they actually have numbers associated with that. These numbers are gigatons of carbon per year, okay? So a gigaton is a billion tons, so we're talking about a billion tons of carbon per year. The atmosphere has about 800 um, gigatons of carbon dioxide. About 120 of, the, of that is drawn down every year through photosynthesis, but it's actually 123 gigatons of carbon dioxide is drawn down into the into biomass through photosynthesis. Plants respire out about half of that. Um, anything that eats those plants, whether that is animals, fungi, bacteria, they're just saying microbial respiration and decomposition is releasing the other half of that, that as um, total creating that 120 gigatons of carbon dioxide that is being drawn down through photosynthesis. But there's that extra three gigatons right there that gets locked in the soil. So the soil carbon is um, gaining three gigatons of carbon every year, adding to this pool of 2,300 gigatons of carbon dioxide. The fossil pool is about 10,000 gigatons of carbon dioxide. We are taking that fossil full pool digging it up and burning it at about a rate of nine gigatons of carbon every year. If we move over to the ocean side, um, we have the air-sea gas exchange where carbon dioxide dissolves in, carbon dioxide gets released, um, powers photosynthesis. That photosynthesis, or those plankton will, um, will respire. All of the animals and the bacteria and fungi and the oceans will respire and they will release you know, that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. Equal but opposite um, formula, 90, 90, but you have that extra two gigatons of carbon dioxide that gets deposited into oceanic sediments. Okay, the main point of this, right, we have two gigatons of carbon dioxide that are settling to the ocean, sorry, two gigatons of carbon, not two gigatons of carbon dioxide, easy trap to fall into, get two gigatons of carbon that settle down to the ocean floor every year, and three gigatons of carbon that are locked in the soil every year, that does not balance out the nine gigatons of carbon that we're releasing from fossil fuel combustion, cement um, production, and other land use change. That is leading to a net increase of four gigatons of carbon dioxide every year in the atmosphere. Okay, this is just one uh, one diagram provided by the Department of Energy. There are different numbers and different values that you'll that you'll see depending on what year you're talking about. I think that this uh, diagram is at least five years old at this point, probably older. Um, 
and different years produce uh, release um, different amounts of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And again, we're talking about um, gigatons of carbon every year. So that's just the C. So we're not talking about CO2, which, you know, carbon itself just has an atomic mass of 12 atomic mass units. Whereas carbon dioxide, if I do some quick mental math, um, will, oops, 42 AMU, right? 12 plus 16 plus 16. Each oxygen atom is 16, and then the carbon is 12, right? 42. Um, my math is wrong, 44. I am bad at math. Sorry about that. So 44 atomic mass units of carbon, um, carbon dioxide every year. So notice that difference, okay? So we are releasing um, lots of carbon, lots of carbon dioxide, lots of methane every year into the atmosphere. Um, but again, this is just one diagram provided by the Department of Energy. Different diagrams, different studies, different authors have different values, and it really depends on the year, the metrics that they're using. It is obviously very difficult to quantify this on a global scale. So that's why you'll see some different numbers um, at different times. All right, so some human impacts on the carbon cycle. The first is emissions of carbon. Um, this is primarily talking about fossil fuel use. So that fossil carbon that has been locked in the soil for millions, tens of millions, 300 million, or sorry, hundreds of millions of years is being released into the atmosphere. Okay, we were taking coal, oil, and natural gas, and we are burning it, and we are releasing primarily carbon dioxide, but also a little bit of carbon monoxide into the atmosphere through that combustion. Also nitrous oxide, but since we're talking about the carbon cycle, um, it's not a carbon containing gas, but it is a greenhouse gases. It is a greenhouse gas. These greenhouse gases, um, about 50 gigatons are released each year. Okay, And again, that's um, the greenhouse gas itself. So the CO2, the N2O itself. Okay, Methane is a greenhouse gas, but it is not from fossil fuel combustion okay you do not produce methane when you produce when you burn anything all right uh, deforestation this will release carbon um, in the form of carbon dioxide methane um, through decomposition through combustion um, and through anaerobic decomposition okay so there is about 10,000 gigatons of carbon locked in all plant matter again going back to the graph about 10,000 gigatons locked in plant matter um, and when we release uh, or sorry when we destroy forests we release that carbon into the atmosphere as one of those forms degradation of soils so soils are eroding um, and just uh, degrading around the planet and there's about you know, 2,700 gigatons of carbon locked in the soil. About two thirds of that is organic, meaning that it can decompose. So if we expose that organic um, carbon to the right conditions, especially oxygen, um, it can decompose um, through bacterial and fungal action. And about a third of that is inorganic. So we're talking about inorganic carbon like limestone or chalk, okay? And because we're talking about um, the like the sorry the 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 last thing the last bullet point on here is not um related to global warming but instead ocean acidification so when carbon dioxide dissolves into water any water including rainwater it will form carbonic acid okay formula is already balanced um that carbonic acid when it's in the oceans leads to ocean acidification, which we'll spend an entire day on later in the year discussing. The primary thing that I want to focus on now is um, the fact that carbon dioxide, methane, and to a lesser extent carbon monoxide are all greenhouse gases. Nitrous oxide is also a greenhouse gas which is released uh, from burning fossil fuels, the nitrogen, um, any nitrogen that's in the fossil fuel. Those are all greenhouse gases and as you increase the concentration of those greenhouse gases, you are going to increase um, the, uh, the global average surface temperature. So I'll say um, average surface temperature. 
Okay, that is going to lead to what we call global climate change. So global warming is a little bit separate from global climate change. Global climate change is incorporating um, or is a result of the warming process, and it's going to result in a lot of different things. So the first is warming of the Arctic. The Arctic is warming faster than anywhere else on the planet. When I say Arctic, I also mean Antarctic. So the poles are both warming faster than anywhere else. That is thawing the sea ice, that's thawing glaciers, that's thawing permafrost, that's uh, thawing ice sheets. And all of that water is running somewhere. And where it runs to ultimately is the oceans leading to rising sea levels. Okay. Plus you have expanding warm waters because as water warms, as the oceans themselves warm, it is going to cause that water to literally expand, right? Um, water that is warmer has less dense, or sorry, is less dense and meaning that the same mass is going to occupy a greater volume and it's literally going to expand. Most of the rising sea level is due to thawing ice, but some of it is due to expanding warm waters. Okay. Um, all of this, uh, the global warming is going to lead to um, the changes in frequency or distribution or severity of storms and droughts. Essentially, it's going to make storms stronger. If there is more heat in the atmosphere, that means that there is more energy that can lead to more evaporation, more water in the atmosphere. And more water plus more heat and energy translates to stronger storms. Okay. Also can influence uh, droughts as well. Okay, Changing species distributions, um, we'll talk about it a little bit later on, but um, each species is adapted for a certain range of temperature conditions, and if those change in an area, that species um, either has to move, migrate out, or it has to um, adapt, or it will go extinct. Okay, some species will benefit for this, and some species will not. Some species um, can go extinct. Okay, one of the more worrisome changes in species distributions is tropical mosquitoes that can carry malaria, dengue fever, yellow fever, um, loss of fever, any of the tropical illnesses expanding into higher latitudes, both north and south. There's other effects, and we will discuss them for, uh, later on in the semester or the school year. So while we're talking about carbon dioxide and while we're talking about the carbon cycle, I thought this was a good time to see um, keeling curves and to talk about keeling curves because you will see these um, throughout the course as I uh, am potentially on the AP test. So keeling curves are named after the scientist that discovered this trend. His name is Charles David Keeling. And long story short, he started monitoring carbon dioxide levels on Mauna Loa and Hawaii, as well as the South Pole in the late 1950s. And the first year that he uh, took these readings, um, this is not from um, his first year, this is actually from March 7th of 2022, but I'll treat it as though it was his first year. Um, he found that carbon dioxide would go down during the Northern Hemisphere summer. So June, July, August, September, carbon dioxide is decreasing. And that as it transitions into fall, October, November, um, carbon dioxide would start to uh, go from decreasing to increasing. During the Northern Hemisphere winter and then into the Northern Hemisphere spring, carbon dioxide would increase in the atmosphere. And then it would fall again during the Northern Hemisphere summer. He didn't know why. Um, at first, he thought it was errors in his instruments or errors in his readings, but then he um, figured it out. Essentially, there is more vegetation on the northern hemisphere than there is in the southern hemisphere. There is more land area in the northern hemisphere. During the northern hemisphere summer, um, those plants will draw down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, incorporate it into their tissues. And then um, as the summer progresses, they draw down more and more and more carbon dioxide. Until it transitions to fall, the plants in the northern hemisphere summer will drop their leaves or go into dormancy. Um, and then um, respiration will outpace, there will be a greater re rate of respiration than there is a photosynthesis, and some of that carbon dioxide is going to be released into the atmosphere throughout the fall, winter, and then into the next spring. And then as plant production really ramps up and starting in May and going through the summer, it will draw down that carbon dioxide again. 
Okay, so Keeling curves just show the essentially breathing of the planet as the northern hemisphere, um, again, more vegetation in the northern hemisphere, as the northern hemisphere draws down carbon dioxide in the summer and then releases it in the fall, winter, and spring. We have great data from um, Mauna Loa from the late 1950s when Keeling started um, doing these curves all the way to the present. And you see that every year there is a increase of carbon dioxide during the winter, decrease during the summer, increase during the winter, decrease during the summer. But that is all the natural system. If it was just the natural system, you would just see it increasing, decreasing, and staying pretty darn constant right around 310, 320 parts per million. But instead, what you see is a net increase of carbon dioxide, right? So despite this seasonal variation, we as humans are releasing so much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere through land use change, such as deforestation, through the production of cement, and predominantly or primarily through the combustion of fossil fuels that we are bucking this trend and increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And so we can extend that data out um, a little bit further using ice core data. So Keeling's data starts in 1958, but ice cores um, have carbon dioxide and atmospheric air from the past 500,000 years um, that we have gotten so far. So we can extend this out um, to 500 years ago and see what happened at maybe the first time that people started burning coal and then early stages of the Industrial Revolution when the Industrial Revolution really started to kick off and then through the early 1900s. And we can see that since we started burning coal, um, that carbon dioxide levels have increased. They did so very slowly at first, but oil and natural gas were discovered through um, throughout the late 1800s and early 1900s, and then um, industrialization, uh, industrialization really ramped up and we get that um, exponential curve. And if we just take that data out a little bit further, you can see that um, in the past two, uh, 2,000 years that it was relatively consistent concentrations of carbon dioxide, a few um, ups and downs here and there, a um, couple very cold years right here, the, um, the Little Ice Age, I believe, and then Industrial Revolution hits and we get that exponential curve. Basically the same thing in the past 10,000 years. So since the dawn of agriculture, more or less steady concentration of carbon dioxide, except for a few ups and downs, but still staying um, within a pretty set range, right? Um, and then again, the massive increase at the Industrial Revolution due to the beginning of burning fossil fuels. And then we can extend this out even further to 800,000 years ago. So I think I misspoke when I said 500,000 years, but 800,000 years ago um, with ice core data. And this is of note because anatomical modern humans, Homo sapiens, um, didn't evolve until you know maybe 300,000 years ago. I believe that the oldest human fossil is about 300,000 years. Um, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, evolving about two million years ago. So this is showing really within um, within uh, our species history. And we see carbon dioxide concentrations increasing and decreasing um, throughout, um, throughout geologic time, throughout the ice ages. So when it is high, we get an interglacial. When it is warm, we get a glacial period, an ice age. And we see the ebb and flow of the ice through the ebb and flow of the carbon dioxide through all that time. Notice where it peaks right around here, we were in an interglacial, we still are in an interglacial, um, but then our concentration of carbon dioxide almost doubling um, the average or um, just about doubling the average um, carbon dioxide. If we say right here, like say 230 parts per million is the average throughout our species history, um, we have just about doubled it um, in the past 150 years. All right, so if we overlay temperature on these carbon dioxide graphs from ice core data, um, this is this graph is just showing the past 500,000 years or 450,000 years. Um, you see that there is a really good correlation between um, carbon dioxide concentration, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration, and average temperature. 
All right. Um, the temperature of 1960 to 1990 is being used as a baseline. Typically, what we'll, that's that's zero. Typically, what we actually use is the year 1750. 1750 is right before the Industrial Revolution, as we traditionally think about, and it's the year that they typically use as the starting point at like temperature zero to tell the difference. Um, but in this graph, they're using um, 19, the average of 1960 and 1990. All right. And because carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, it influences temperature. And you see a very good correlation between those two lines. Um, as carbon dioxide levels increase, temperature follows and increases. As carbon dioxide levels decrease, temperature follows and um, decreases. All right, there is typically a little bit of a lag time there, often not enough to really see on the graph, but um, you know, a few years in real life. And then of course you see the spike up to um, above uh, uh, 350 parts per million up to almost 400 parts per million um, that we have released so far. And we are expected to see that temperature rise accordingly. In fact, we have seen a one degree um, Celsius increase in global average temperatures since 1970, or sorry, 1750. One degree Celsius may not sound a lot, but that is about 2.2 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So that is a relatively significant amount. The heating of the planet is not equal. It's heating at a faster rate in the polar regions um, and at a very slow rate in the equatorial regions, but we are seeing average globally a one degree Celsius increase since 1750. Okay, about one degree Celsius. All right. As we increase that carbon dioxide level, we are expected to see that temperature um, keep increasing as well. And then just showing who is implicated um, in the rise of those greenhouse gases. So this one on the left, just showing greenhouse gases in general and the energy se our economic sector that they are coming from. The one on the right showing carbon dioxide specifically. Um, China emits the most carbon dioxide. The United States follows at number two. The India, uh, India is number three at a distant third. Russia, very close to India at number four. Japan at number five, Germany at number six, and then just down from there. All right, so there is one more part of the carbon cycle that I want to quickly mention, and that's the geologic carbon cycle. So there is the very long-term carbon cycle um, that is happening around the planet all the time. Essentially what happens is that atmospheric carbon dioxide is going to create calcium carbonate sediments um, through the weathering of silicate rock. We do not need to know the formulas of that. You notice that there's a lot of reactants and products that are missing here, but atmospheric carbon dioxide will get drawn down and form inorganic um, calcium carbonate, limestone or chalk, okay? That cycle is completed through volcanism. So as volcanic activity goes through um, those Cal, uh, those carbon rich rocks, it releases carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere, which again completes that cycle. However, that cycle is not even. The rate of weathering is going to exceed the rate of volcanism. So more carbon dioxide is going to be drawn down through weathering than is released into the atmosphere through volcanism. Okay, so weathering on the left, volcanism on the right, more carbon dioxide is gonna be drawn down through weathering than is gonna be released through volcanism. But this is a very, very slow process. It has been occurring since the beginning of, um, you know, the planet as we know it. And over geologic time, it's resulted in the drawing down of carbon dioxide. You have probably noticed, but not thought about it a lot, that um, the planet was warmer during the Carboniferous, during the Triassic, during the Cretaceous. During those periods in the past, um, the Earth was warmer and progressively getting cooler. Um, and this is one of the reasons for it. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, has you know, tectonic activity has a huge um, impact, the position of the continents, oceanic currents. But in general, this is driving that. 
So carbon dioxide is being drawn down over geologic time and it could possibly make the earth uninhabitable in about 800 million years as carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere fall below what plants can currently use for photosynthesis. Now they probably will evolve um, to use less carbon dioxide by then, but who knows, okay? So we're not really worried about this. We're not worried about what's going to happen in 800 million years through natural processes. What we're worried about is carbon dioxide emissions happening right now um, through human activity and what that means for the planet. It means a warmer planet. It means um, unpredictable and uncertain weather and climatic events. It means ocean acidification. It means warming oceans, rising sea level, all of those things. All of those things could lead to a mass extinction event that could wipe out um, you know, many species on the planet, many of which we have already wiped out through um, various human activities, okay? But our ge like all of this activity of humans will all weather out in geologic time and we're, our, our activity is just gonna be a blip on the graph and that's about it, okay? So I'm gonna show a quick diagram showing that and then wrap this up. So real quick with the geologic um, portion of the carbon cycle, um, carbon dioxide and water are going to form carbonic acid. Again, that is H2CO3. And rainwater is slightly acidic because it does have carbonic acid in it. Um, you see that, that through the weathering of that silicate rock, right, we are eventually making calcium carbonate. That calcium carbonate is going to settle down to the bottom of the oceans and form inorganic sediments that can be uplifted or they can get drawn down into uh, the mantle through tectonic activity and melt and then that carb carbon dioxide can be released through volcanism. Again, the rate of weathering is going to exceed the rate of volcanism, so more carbon dioxide is going to be drawn down over time than is going to be released over time. So the geologic carbon cycle is um, the most minor part of this. What you guys really should know is what's listed in this essential knowledge. Okay, So the carbon cycle is the movement of atoms and molecules containing the element carbon between sources and sinks. We talked about the different sources and the different sinks and how carbon moves through that. Most of that is through chemical changes. Okay, Some of the reservoirs in which carbon compounds occur in the carbon cycle hold those compounds for long periods of time. That could be calcium carbonate rock. That could be fossil fuels. Those are the two that hold it for the longest period of times. Oceanic sediments and soils also hold a lot of carbon for geologic periods of time. Okay, some of them, so those are long periods of time, some of them hold it for relatively short periods of time. The main ones here is biomass, vegetation, and animal matter. Okay, even if a, even if a plant lives for 2,000 years, it will eventually die and it will eventually rot and release that carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. That's not a geologically significant period of time. That's a relatively short period of time. Okay. Uh, carbon cycles between photosynthesis and cellular respiration in living things. Again, that is mostly an equal and opposite process, but some carbon does um, get locked into soil or get locked into sediments, okay, whether terrestrial or, or uh, marine. Plant and animal decomposition have led to the storage of carbon over millions of years. Um, that is really referencing the fossil fuels. And I don't like that term decomposition there because it is partially decomposed matter, but um, it's mostly matter that escaped decomposition. If it decomposed fully, it would be carbon dioxide or methane in the atmosphere. It would not be carbon locked in, um, in, in, in the rock, okay? So I take issue a little bit with that term decomposition, but what this is essentially saying is that plant and animal remains that settle down to um, oceanic or the ocean bottom or into swamps or into peat bogs can get compressed over time and form fossil fuels. Okay, those fossil fuels, um, burning those fossil fuels rather, quickly moves that stored carbon into the atmosphere um, in the form of carbon dioxide. So when we burn fossil fuels, we are increasing 
um, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, increasing atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations um, very, very rapidly. And I just wanted to briefly mention um, the essential knowledge from learning objective 9.4. We are increasing um, greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere and the effects that those are ha will have. Global climate change caused by excess greenhouse gases in the atmosphere can lead to a variety of environmental problems, rising sea levels, um, and then disease vector spreading from the tropics towards the poles. What that's saying is uh, mosquitoes that carry malaria or dengue fever moving from the tropics and shifting their ranges into um, the higher latitudes as the higher latitudes warm. Um, but we talked about a lot of other ones, or at least briefly mentioned a lot of other ones, warming oceans, ocean acidification, um, changes in the um, regularity and severity of storms and droughts, et cetera. Okay, so just keep these in mind as we keep talking about the carbon cycle, um, but I just wanted to briefly mention them here. All right, I hope you guys learned something. I'll see you all in class.